Uh, so first of all, thank you for having me out here. Um, it is great to be back in Hayes. Um, certainly had some of the most fun years of my life here in the city of Hayes. Um, appreciate having a uh, person, a very worthy person to be talking about Convention of the States, Article 5 process today. Appreciate you coming out as well. Um, I'm here today representing the Convention of the States Project. I'm actually a state director for the Convention of the States Project. Uh, it's founded by uh, Mark Meckler, who just happened to also be the Tea Party Patriots co-founder, as well as Michael Ferris, a constitutional attorney, uh, who just happens to also be one of two attorneys alive that have actually argued an Article 5 case in front of the Supreme Court. We're founded on the premise that, the, that Washington is out of control due to spending, taxing, seizing more and more power with no check on its authority. There are endless pages of regulations, laws, that nobody ever that has the time to even read. Our basic premise is Washington will, not be, will never fix itself. There must be a way that we as as individuals can step in and fix fix Washington. I'm not here to change Mr. Fry's assessment on, on or convince him of his views on the subject of wrong in any way. I'm here to give hope to conservatives within earshot of where I can where I can speak that there is a way back from where we are now. I'll yield back the rest of my time. Uh, good evening to everyone. I'm always happy to be able to spend some time with some of my fellow patriots. I, I appreciate Roger setting this up and uh, David coming to, to debate this. This is a very, very important issue. I think this is probably one of the two greatest things, uh, threats to our country, to our liberty that exists right now. Uh, the other would be the citizen detention provisions of the 2012 uh, National Defense Authorization Act. So this does deserve your, your attention and, and your respect. Now, when I refer to the promoters of the Article Five Convention, I'm referring to the top echelons and the leaders of that movement that initiated the movement and that are pushing it along. I'm not talking about Mr. Snyder. I'm not talking about our fellow grassroots uh, citizens who have joined and are helping in the movement. Um, I believe that they're doing that out of a sense of patriotism. I believe that they are uninformed and misinformed and misguided. And I believe that they're acting out of fear and desperation. Mr. Snyder and I have been asked here tonight to debate the merits of amending our Constitution to deal with the problem of our public servants not following the Constitution. The Constitution is not the problem. Therefore, Article 5 Convention for proposed amendment cannot be the solution. The root problem is that we citizens are not holding our candidates and our public servants accountable and can in part because of our own ignorance and lack of faith and courage. If you are told today that the problem is a one run runaway federal government, you need to think wrong problem. And if you're all told today that amending the Constitution is the solution, you need to think wrong solution. Those whom we have been electing, at least for the last 80 years, have been marginalizing, undermining, and ignoring the Constitution they have sworn to support and protect. In fact, the vast majority of our elected officials have not read and or do not understand the Constitution. They have treated their sacred oath to support the Constitution as a mere ministerial act and a functionary act that has about as much weight and importance as squatting an animal. They no longer fear the fires of hell and they no longer fear the wrath of the people. Most of our public officials do not understand the underlying principles of federalism or what I call the promise of federalism. In a House hearing in the 2012 Kansas Legislative Session, Discussing a bill to acknowledge the unconstitutional indefinite citizen detention provisions of the 2012 National Defense Authorization Act, Noni Myers, a representative, stated she did not believe the Kansas le legislature had the authority to request or direct the federal delegation to repeal such. How very shocking, but it's also very commonplace. 
in my national work against the National Defense Authorization Act, I have heard this same sentiment expressed over and over again by city, county, sheriffs, state legislators in Oregon, Michigan, New York, California, and literally coast to coast. I can name you the number of public officials who have any understanding of the meaning and significance of the inherent sovereign principle of allegiance and protection on one hand. Now I know that Mr. Snyder is saying that Mr. Fry is being very generous in making my case for me. But in reality, I'm showing you the folly of the argument that we can make public servants follow the Constitution by amending the Constitution. If that were true, we need only make one amendment to the Constitution, and it would be public servants must follow the Constitution, and we mean it this time. The Article 5 Convention advocates have not identified the root problem at all, nor will their solution cure the problem they have identified, let alone solve the root problem. Where do these public servants come from? They come from the general population. They come from among us. Their lack of knowledge and understanding of how the republic is supposed to work is a reflection of our lack of knowledge and how the republic is supposed to work. Who elected these incompetent people into office? We did. How many of you have read and understand the Constitution? We have 200 years of case law that says it was written for the average citizen or the average voter so they could understand it. If you consider yourself at least average, then you should be able to read and understand the Constitution. It was not written for judges. It was not written for law professors. It was written for we the people. How many of you understand the principle of sovereignty? How many of you have even heard of the ancient inherent sovereign principle of allegiance and protection? It is the great fire law that protects our liberty. How many of you understand the principle of federalism upon which our republic is founded? And do you know what the promise of federalism is? If you do not understand these things, the Constitution, the principles of sovereignty, allegiance and protection, and the promise of federalism, how can you know if those you vote for understand them? And how can you know if they are following them? I guess we are at the point that it's no longer an issue because 99% of our elected officials do not understand these concepts. How many of you have participated in vetting candidates in the last five years? And how can you vet a politician if you yourself do not understand the foundations of our republic? In fact, the two senators recalled by the good people of Colorado for voting for, uh, for voting for gun grabbing bills had said as a candidate that they supported the Second Amendment. They just had a different perspective of the Second Amendment than did the citizens. It would have been a little nicer to know that before they put them in office. As you see, or you see, as we citizens have a patriotic duty to know the foundation of the Republic, and we have a duty to vet candidates. If you believe, as the Founding Fathers did, and as I do, that the creation of this Republic was at the hand of God, then you have a moral duty to do what it takes to protect and preserve the liberty and prosperity given to our forefathers by the grace of God. How many of you have simply been relying upon the candidate's party affiliation as a basis to vote for them? Well, shame on you. Since I have been going to Topeka as a constitutional advocate, I have not lost one bill because of the Democrat. All our losses on immigration and civil liberty issues, such as the NADA, have been caused by Republicans. It was our own conservative Republican Governor Brownback that brought Obamacare to Kansas. Governor Brownback is a leading advocate for the implementation of sustainable development in Kansas. Sustainable development is absolutely incompatible with the American form of government and the Constitution and liberty itself. How many of you are a one-issue voter? If the candidate is pro-life, you vote for him, period. And if the candidate is pro-Second Amendment, you vote for him, period. Shame on you. You are a big part of the problem. So if the real problem is not our public servant's failure to follow the Constitution, then what is it? The root problem is that we as citizens are not holding our candidates and public servants accountable and can't because of our own ignorance and lack of faith. If this issue is not addressed, the Republic is lost. This is the one and only thing that can save the Republic. 
Now, what do constitutional revisionists want to talk about? They have two main topics. First, what are the mechanics of an Article 5 convention? Will we call it a con con or a convention of states? Who will control it? The states or Congress? Can a Supreme Court intervene in the process or not? Can it be limited to a single issue, topic, or even amendment? And can we assure ourselves of the end result up front or not? Secondly, what amendments to our Constitution should be made? The questions you must ask yourself are, first, will who controls the convention make it any more likely or less likely that our public servants will then follow a newly amended Constitution? Isn't the answer to that question obvious? We have incompetent, incompetent liars and thieves in Washington and in the states. Now, why will they all of a sudden change from their wicked self-serving ways? Secondly, will any amendment added to our Constitution make it any more or less likely that our politicians will all of a sudden change from their wicked self-serving ways and obey the newly revised Constitution? Why do the revisionists want to talk about issues that are not relevant to the problems they have identified? For the same reason they don't want to talk about the root problem itself. It is a common diversionary, diversionary tactic used by politicians, attorneys, and con men, but then I repeat myself. If they can get you asking the wrong questions, they don't have to worry about the answers. Remember, the root problem is not the fact that our public servants are not following the Constitution. The root problem is we, the people, are not prepared, able, or willing to hold our public servants accountable when they do not follow the Constitution. If the Constitution is not the problem, why is amending it a solution? A solution that does not address the problem is no solution at all. Okay, question. What is or what are the problems we are seeking to resolve by an Article 5 convention? Would you like me to go first again? Well, I think uh, after our opening remarks over on the other side here, I think he named quite a few things, and I think he made my case, up, as he said, very well said, uh, regarding what we're looking to solve. Uh, we do have a runaway government, and I know that that's a, what he had indicated. Um, the original design of our Constitution allowed for states to hold most of the power and at least as a check to our federal government. <coughs> convention of states or um, amendments convention, whatever you want to call it, is there, it's in the Constitution. It's part of Article 5. It isn't a constitutional process. Um, it is a, a process to rein in the federal government that is, is the founders knew that this day would come at some point. General George Mason, I believe, was quoted as from Madison's notes, putting it right there in 1789 that said that we, we must have a second way of amending the Constitution. Um, the first way, as we all know, is done by Congress, with, and then it's sent to the states for two-thirds ratification vote. The second way is what we're talking about today, and that's regarding a convention of states being called when two-thirds of the states apply for and are granted a convention to be held, in which delegates from each of the states would attend and would be there to propose amendments those same amendment, those amendments have the same weight as the ones that would be uh, proposed by Congress. What were the, the, then they would go to the states for ratification, the same way traditional amendments would be. Our goal is to rein in the federal government. So what we're seeking is a limited convention regarding limiting the federal government, the size and scope of the federal government. A convention called on a single subject, not a single amendment, not an open convention, but a convention that's called on a single subject. Or also the ideas of certain amendments that could come out of that, that 
that process that, um, would include balanced budget amendment. I know that we've been trying to get a balanced budget amendment through the Congress forever. Kansas has passed an application back in 1979 for a balanced budget amendment convention to be held. Unfortunately, we've never received 32 other, 34 other states, 33 other states to go along with us. Currently, the balanced budget amendment has, I believe, 16 states that have passed that same resolution asking for that same convention on that single, that single amendment. What we're looking for is a group of amendments to help rein in the government and restore the, the framers of the Constitution's initial design of the, of the Constitution. As Mr. Fry had indicated, we are operating outside of the Constitution, there's no doubt. And there are a couple provisions in the Constitution that are, that are in essence, bastardized. We've got the Commerce Clause that's abused, most notably as of late with Obamacare. <coughs> we also have um, a couple other uh, other items in the Constitution that honestly aren't, aren't being adhered to, and he asked, "Why would we? Uh, why would we think that Congress or anybody else would ever listen to the Constitution?" Well, my friends, we we have no other document in in this country that uh, sets up laws initially, at least. It is the basis of all of our laws. If we if we operate with that mentality, what's the, what's the next step? Anarchy? Revolution? I, I don't know. But I see this as our last best hope to restore what the framers initially had intended. Um, I know I would like to restore the states, the power that were given to the states. Um, and certainly as a check to the federal government. In any way we can bring that power back to the states, so back to the local level, I think would certainly address some of our issues of our ignorance that he is so wise to point out that most of, most of you have never heard of those things that he had talked about. I don't think most of anybody has. But they know, people know what's right and what's wrong. And we know what we're operating in today is, is wrong. Uh, they feel that they're alienated by their own country. And what I'm here today to tell you today is there, a, there is a way, there is a constitutional way to have this restored. And what we're proposing is the states take charge in a constitutional way to propose amendments that not obliterate, not change the original intent of the Constitution, but strengthen the original intent such as the Commerce Clause, not to include <coughs> commerce that happens within a state, but back to the original intent, maybe as far as commerce within, between the states, or outside of the United States. Those things need to be clarified because they are being misapplied by the judiciary. That's why we're proposing amendments, but these amendments if we rely on Washington to do it, it's so filled with special interests and lobbyists that it'll never happen. We send good people to Washington every year, good, solid, as we think, conservatives that, that change. Either it's by the, the money that's flattened in front of them or whatever it is, it's the culture of Washington that needs to be fundamentally changed. We have the power to bring that power back to the local governments, our state representatives, our state senators. We can talk to our state representatives. They go to our church. We see them at stores in town. It's nearly impossible, with a few exceptions, to talk to your state, your, your, uh, your, your Washington delegation. What we're advocating is, is to bring that education back to the local level. That's why we're building a grassroots network and trying to get individuals motivated and excited about this process and truly getting this, the state representatives and the state senators restored to the powerful level that they should have been at, at the framing of our Constitution.
Well, I certainly agree that the federal government's out of control and they're not honoring the Constitution. That's, none of us doubt that at all. Uh, and I think that our republic is on the verge of, of collapsing. Uh, for purpose of this today, I will concede uh, all of Mr. Snyder's contentions regarding the mechanics of the conventions uh, and the successful ratification of amendments he proposes. But I will not concede that they have identified the wrong, the right problem, and I will not concede that their solution solves the problem they identified, and it certainly will not solve the root problem. This country was established on Judeo-Christian values. If anybody doesn't believe that, just hold up your hand and let me know if I'm wrong on any of this. And part of those Judeo-Christian values includes personal responsibility. That's what redemption and confession is all about. So let me ask you this. Who is the boss in the United States? In the law we call it a master-servant relationship. Who is the master? Who is the sovereign in the United States? Does anybody know? I am. You are. We the people. Now who is responsible to make sure that a servant does what he's supposed to do? The master, the we the people. That's the problem. We're not doing it. That's why we have the problem we do. Now, you have to understand, even though I want to concede some of these things, or I will for the purpose of this today, because they're not relevant. There are at least four different factions of folks out there calling for a con con. And they all have different ideas. Some think that the delegates are ambassadors of the state, controlled by the state legislature. Some think that they're free agents that represent the people, uh, which is really the, what the Supreme Court has said uh, about the first uh, convention that we, that we had that gave us our current uh, constitution. Uh, and they all have different ideas about whether it can be limited to a topic or an amendment. Okay, So they don't agree. None of them agree. What we have, what I have here, is a list of all the different uh, amendments that are being proposed. I've got 11 of those from Mark Levine. I have another 10 from Randy Barrett. And then I have 23 that are proposed by Larry Sabato. There's a total of 60 amendments that different people are proposing. 60 amendments that different people are proposing. Does anybody know how many amendments we have to our Constitution today? That's right, 27. Do any of you know how many of those amendments uh, affected or altered in any way the Constitution? No? You want to get it? How many? 17. Why did I say 17? Because the Bill of Rights didn't add anything to the Constitution and didn't take anything away from the Constitution. Right? Those were rights that everybody acknowledged existed. But the Anti-Federalists, in order to, to push additional states uh, to ratify the Constitution, added the Bill of Rights. So they didn't add anything. So, in 200 years, we've had 17 amendments to our Constitution. These guys are proposing 60. 60. On that point, um, what we're proposing is a convention to discuss those 60 amendments that other people have. There's no chance that 60 amendments would ever come out of a convention. My guess, anybody's guess, would be a handful at the most. And keep in mind, any, any, any amendment that comes out of a convention still would have to be passed by three-fourths of the states. That's 38 states that it would have to sign off on it. That's right in the Constitution in Article 5 in both processes, and every amendment that we've had to the Constitution has faced that same hurdle. It is a very tall hurdle. 38 states would have to agree that that, amend, that singular amendment, because each of them would have to be voted on individually, not as a package, 
not as a group, but individually, would have to be ratified by 38 states. Okay, now I know he mentions 60, 80, 100, whatever amendments there are. That's great. That means we have ideas. It's better than not having ideas. People are talking. They're trying to hammer out, okay, what is going to be best? Is when we don't have ideas, or we say it's, we're going to keep electing conservatives and expect a different outlook. Hey, I'm all for electing conservatives. I think a lot, everybody in this room wants to make sure that we keep electing conservatives. But what we're, what we're saying is, the rules in Washington need to change. We've got to fundamentally change Washington, set some ground rules and fix some things so when we send the conservatives, they can actually do something. Let's go to the next uh, question. We uh, basically have even tried to answer the, the next question, which is, how will an Article 5 convention resolve those problems? So the first question is, what were the problems? This is how would this convention resolve those problems? David? Well, I think it goes hand in hand with that last question that we had. I think we've addressed a lot of it already. Uh, but my point, again, I'll, I'll, I'll try to make this several times. But Washington's broke. Um, they're not going to fix themselves. We know that. They're never going to vote themselves term limits. <laughs> never. I don't care how much we keep sending solid people up there. Once they get there, they're not going to relinquish their power. They never will have. They would allow themselves to, to have raises every year if they could, but we passed an amendment to the Constitution that says they can't. We had to actually get an amendment to the Constitution to avoid people from raising their own salaries. Okay, so they're never going to rein in their own power. We have career politicians. They've been there 30, 40, 50 years in some instances. We have to do something and this is an idea. This is a this is a solution big enough to tackle the problem that we're facing. Uh, one of the things they like to talk about is these the fail safes that uh, are available in this in this process. And the first one they mentioned is Congress. Congress is going to be a fail safe if something goes haywire. Okay. But, you know, of course, it's Congress that they want to rein in, okay? The second is the Supreme Court. If things go wrong, they, seem, they say the Supreme Court can intervene. Well, the Supreme Court may or may not be able to intervene. But again, they don't like the way the Supreme Court operates. They want to change the Supreme Court. And I agree. Those people are horrendous, right? Um, and then, of course, the last, they say, is we get to ratify it, right? And so, man, that's it. It's not going to get past us. How many of you support the 16th Amendment? How many of you like the income tax stuff that's going on and the IRS snooping on us? All right, how's that? That went through ratification, right? We did that. Have you ever heard of the 17th Amendment? Does anybody like that? 17th Amendment is when they, dis they disassembled the form of government that the founders set up. Under the founders, the people were represented by the House, right? The House represented us. But the Senate represented the states. And what are they complaining about? They're complaining about the fact that state sovereignty has been deteriorating. Well, why wouldn't it? They don't have representatives in the Senate anymore because somebody proposed the 17th Amendment and the states ratified the damn thing. I agree that we don't need to have a 17th Amendment. But don't think for a second that we won't ratify something that shouldn't be ratified, okay? And one thing is, we're not going to be voting on it, right? Do you think you and I are going to be delegates that are voting on that? I think not. It's a political process, a political process that we all understand is broken, and it will be filled by political people. He makes mention of two amendments that I believe both of them are bad amendments. Um, he, I certainly concede that fact 100%, both the 16th and 17th Amendments. But you got to remember, 
when those amendments actually went through, there was a huge progressive movement across the United States. And they had the grassroots network that were forcing, not forcing, but basically had the groundswell. And the 17th, uh, 16th Amendment was passed very similarly by, the con by Congress, or proposed by Congress and ratified by the states. Uh, to basically strip the states of their power, just as he indicates. I'd love to see that one repealed, and I would love an amendment that says that. There's no other, Congress isn't going to, re again, relinquish that power that they have. The Senate is never going to pass a, a, a constitutional amendment repealing the 16th or the 17th Amendment. We as a state and as people have the power to go around the federal government and do it ourselves. And that's what we're advocating. Okay, but again, anything that we propose or anybody else propose, whoever those candidate or those convention members might be, there's one vote per state. States can vote for each of the amendments in the convention process, and then those amendments that have the majority will go back to the states for ratification. It is a brilliant thing that the founders put in, in place. And that's what we're advocating, is the discussion to begin. What kind of amendments? What does this country need to do? And to educate people on the Constitution. We don't teach civics class. As you had indicated earlier, we don't teach civics to our kids. We, as an organization, are committed to the grassroots and trying to get the energy out there to show people that there is a way back. We have a plan, and we're trying to solve the, the, the problem that is that's facing this country and bring it back to the founder's initial design. Okay, next question. Who is behind an Article 5 convention now? Who is behind an Article 5 convention? Oh, I'd be happy to start it off. This is another very important uh, issue. Uh, and nobody's talking about this one, but let's let's look at it. And I've done a paper on this, a research paper. It's called uh, the, Four Found the Four Foundations Quest for Globalism, the Hong Kong Convention. In, 19, in the early 1960s, the Ford Foundation helped to establish a NGO, a non-governmental organization called the Fund for the Republic. It gave them $6.5 million. The Fund for the Republic then set up the Center for Democratic Institutions, and the Ford Foundation gave them $25 million. And their task was to rewrite our Constitution. To do that, they put Rex Tuckwell in charge of the project. Now, he was a liberal professor from Columbia University, a socialist, uh, and was also, his claim to fame was that he was FDR's head of the Goodwill Brain Trust. So, see, he had experience in writing legislation and programs that could convert our society to socialism. Now, he was saying that when the 17th and 16th Amendments uh, were passed. We had a surge of the progressive movement. Well, what do you think we have now with Obamacare, where the government's taking over one sixth of our economy? It's socialism everywhere we look. That's what's going on. Now, our friend Mr. Pipewell was also a supporter of regional government. Does anybody know what regional government is? Have you ever heard of that? What is, what is a regional government? The Biden's United States. 13 regions and governed by this way I get it. Is that obviously that's right? yeah, that's absolutely correct. It's it's dividing the, the government up into regions of uh, councils. Have you ever heard of a, a comprehensive planning commission or the Mid American uh, Planning Commission? Right? What the what Russia would call them is the Mid America Planning Soviet. Soviet means council. That's what Russia had with Soviets. Mr. Tugwell spent some time in Russia before all this. So he, he understood that. He was called an internationalist. They didn't have the term globalist, I guess, at the time. He was on a committee to frame the world constitution. 
and the constitution that he prepared uh, at the behest of the Ford Foundation abolished the states and it set up 10 federal regions that were subordinate to the federal government. So, you know, from Russia with love, council is a Soviet, right? In 19, between 1973 and 1976, Nelson Rockefeller, who was a friend of Mr. Pugwell's and promoted his constitution, attempted to get a convention of states going so he could push a balanced budget. Uh, also, in 1973, ALEC was formed, which is one of the major organizations pushing this thing right now. In the mid-80s, there was a push again for an Article 5 convention, uh, again to push the balanced budget. Now, in the 80s, they said it was going to be a limited convention, because when Rockefeller's proposed it in the 70s, the public didn't like it very well. They thought that the, the Constitution was open for grabs. So now, the next time they come back around, they're saying it's going to be a limited convention. And at this point in time, the Rockefeller Foundation was also involved funding organizations to promote it. In the 1990s, uh, then they had a push for yet another uh, Article 5, and they were calling it the Convention of States. And again, they're pushing the balanced budget. In the 1980s, uh, Phyllis Shapley, with Eagle Forum, was one of the leaders that stopped it, stopped that incident. And she had a series of conversations with then-retired Chief Justice uh, Warren Burger, who was, had retired to be on the uh, Constitutional Bicentennial campaign. And he was approached by a political operative uh, of trying to promote this uh, constitutional convention and showed them showed him a constitution that they kind of wanted to ease on in there. And the judge wrote to Phyllis Shapley and he said, the professors, quote unquote, uh, are proposing something I don't understand. They're wanting to abolish the states and set up federal regions. Well, it was the Tugwell constitution, of course. Uh, and so we have a direct line from the 1960s up to the late 80s where these same folks are pushing a, a constitutional convention, most recently a limited constitutional convention, and the key point that they want to push is a balanced budget. All right? Now, they're pushing a convention of states with state control. This is the new twist, that the states control it. Of course, Article 5 is in the Constitution. It's a federal procedure. Congress has the authority, no one else, Congress has the authority to call the convention. And if you've been involved in conventions, you understand that the people that call it get to make the rules, right? Now, some of them say they want it open, some of them want it limited, some of them want it limited to an amendment, some of them want it limited to a topic, some of them want it limited to a subject. The new aspect of it is they are attempting to do a run around the people, really, and they're trying to go, particularly Alley, directly to the legislators. All right? How many of you contacted uh, Brett Hildebrand sometime in the last year and said, could you please do something to initiate a change to our Constitution? Did any of you do that? Did any of you contact Cook, Senator Cook, and say, Senator Cook, I really think that we need to initiate a change to our Constitution. I don't think you did that. But you know what? Last session, they both introduced resolutions for a constitutional convention to change our, uh, to amend our Constitution. And just a month ago, they attended a meeting to uh, further discuss that. They are out there on their own as free agents, promoted by Adelaide these organizations, right? They're not there for us. I didn't ask anybody to amend my constitution. I love my constitution. I say to amend it, not amend it. That's what I say. It's the wrong problem and it's the wrong solution. I think the original question was who's behind it. Um, 
And he made some great points. There is a lot of history re regarding the Article 5 process. As a matter of fact, there's actually been 400 or nearly 400 applications from the states over the years for an Article 5 convention. We've never had one. 400, you do the math. There's plenty enough applications out there to get a convention. Why have we never had a convention? Well, simple fact, we've never had a single topic on the convention application with a significant number of states now being 30, 30, uh, 34. We've never had 34 applications on the single topic. So to your point, <clears throat> there are a lot of groups that are out there and there's been a lot of attempts to amend the Constitution, but no one's ever been successful. My group certainly has got a tall task in front of it. Um, 34 states have, ha or 34 applications have to come in with the same application. And to your point, we believe that it should be a limited topic. Prior applications have only dealt with one single uh, amendment. Kansas actually has a standing call right now for a balanced budget amendment. It's been out there since 1979, it's never been rescinded, it's still out there and still standing. If enough states go along with that, we'll have a convention. There's several other topics that are out there. To my point, the application is very, very important. They all have to be on the single topic. What we're asking is a topic to be included that limits the federal government or the size and scope of the, the federal government. That's what we're advocating. I can see that there are other groups out there trying to do some other even crazy things. Um, some notable people that are, have signed off on the process. Author Mark Levin has come out with a book, I think you mentioned in the press release, uh, called The Liberty Amendments. He's a well-respected conservative. Um, Professor Robert Nadelson, Professor Randy Barnett, Professor Nick uh, Drainius, Professor Lawrence Lessing, Rush Limbaugh, Sean Hannity, Glenn Beck, Senator Colbert, Governor Mike Huckabee, and hundreds of state legislators that you've, that you've um, um, talked about with the ALEC Convention, um, including six, you named a couple that were in attendance from Kansas, but we actually had six representatives and senators from the state of Kansas that attended the Mount Vernon Assembly in December, just last month. You asked if anybody had talked to those senators and those representatives, and I'll raise my hand, I have. I've talked to them. I told them that we want a limited uh, amendment convention. We don't want an open convention. And furthermore, we want specific we want specific laws and regulations passed within Kansas to limit that convention and our delegates that we send to that convention by law must abide by the will of the people. However we determine that in the state of Kansas because we're a sovereign state. Each state will have their own rules on how they select their delegates. He asked that question as well. The states get this side. We as the people talk to our state representatives. Imagine that. We actually get to call up our state reps. They never hear from us. Because most of the things that they do are irrelevant. They don't have as big of an uh, impact on our life as we see it, but we're impacted daily by the federal government. Again, we're trying to push that power back to those state reps so we can have that access. We can talk to our state senators, we can talk to our state senator representatives. But the list of people are growing every day because they realize the fact that we've gone over the tipping point. And there's only a few ways out of it. Even electing and trying to send the right people is certainly not going to outweigh some of the damage that's been done. We've got to change the rules in Washington. And the only way that I see that's big enough is the, what we're proposing with the Convention of States. So the next question uh, is, who will select the delegates? So, uh, who wants to start? I can start on that. <clears throat> According to precedents, uh, the states select their own delegates. I know um, the, the 
fact of the matter is we've never had a convention of states. So there is some unknowns, and that's what um, he's going to play on some fears. The fear of the unknown is always uh, always a scary thing. And there has some have been attempts by communists, by socialists, by other means to pervert um, our our beloved constitution. What what we know from looking at the original convention and a couple other conventions since then, that the states have the right to select their own delegates. They can send as many as they want. In the original, in the convention to actually uh, for the Constitution, states had anywhere from one delegate to ten delegates. Not all of them signed it, but they were there. But in the end, only one vote per state. We knew we know certain rules, and we're ready to argue them. Okay. Um, The original convention um, that that came uh, that uh, that birthed our our constitution. I, I think I heard that uh, from the other side that it was a little it was unchecked or or was what they call a runaway convention. And I I know that that argument's been put out there, but I tell you I. And looking at everything, I don't know why we would defend a document that we all love. Why we would defend it if it was unlawfully originally adopted. Um, I just don't support that argument at all. I believe that the fr framers were well within the, the, the state's uh, instructions and in forming a, a new document that not only strengthened the Articles of Confederation, it still incorporated a lot of the parts of the Articles of Confederation, but it gave us something much stronger called our Constitution. And then, again, our states ratified it. So, to that point. Well, again, I have to ask, will any amendment to the Constitution uh, make, or why will it make, how will it make uh, our federal uh, servants all of a sudden obey the Constitution. You know, they all, under the Constitution, have to take an oath to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution. You know, it's one of those deals where you raise your hand to God and say, I swear. And they've been violating that for, well, 100 years, at least. So all of a sudden, we're going to give them a new piece of paper that has no history, no legal precedence. Nothing to go by. It's all new now. And they're going to obey it. And they're going to obey it the way we want. Right? Um, I mean, it just doesn't make any sense. The other thing that, that, that is of a concern is um, the, the convention itself is a federal convention. Right? It's a national convention. It's authorized under Article 5 of the Constitution. And it says, I'm going to paraphrase it, but it says Congress on the application of Sarah, uh, the two-thirds of the state shall call a convention. The authority is in Congress to call the convention. The person who calls the convention, I don't know if you've been to national conventions, I have, uh, the person that calls it gets to make the initial rules, and they're the ones that get to determine uh, the, the qualifications of the delegates that they choose. That's just the way it works. Now, in the first, uh, when they modified the articles of confederation and gave us the current uh, Constitution again, Congress did direct that the states should select their delegates. But there's no guarantee that they're going to do that this time. And they're in charge. The other thing it says is uh, that, the, that these amendments have to be ratified by the legislatures of the several states of, which means belonging to the several states, right? Or by convention in three-fourths of the states thereof. So the convention, the only constitutional requirement is that it be held in, in the state. It doesn't have to be of the state. It doesn't, it doesn't direct that the representatives even have to come from the state. It's all up in the air. And he's right. We have to take some risk. I don't think I'm willing to throw the constitution on the table and, and take a gamble when it's our fault to fix it 
And this will not solve the problem. It's not going to make us do our job. Right? And what they're telling you is, it's those lying, worthless politicians, uh, and we're going to take care of that. It's not your fault. It's their fault. And we're going to take care of it for you by a convention. Right? We're going to amend your constitution. So you guys can just kind of go on back home, be quiet, and go about your daily business, and we'll leave just fine. Well, the definition of insanity is if you keep doing the same thing and expect a different result. And if we keep doing the same thing, we're going to get the same thing. If we're going to sit on our butt, even with a new amendment or a new constitution, we're going to get the same situation, right? Why don't you know, we know we need to get rid of the scoundrels that are lying and stealing and cheating, right? That's what we need to do. Um, now, the other thing I want to make a quick note of is he's talking about the extent of the convention and how limited it's going to be. Um, I have a, a concurrent resolution, and this isn't hypothetical. This thing's been filed. It's a South, from South Carolina, from South Carolina here. And here's what they're asking for. They want to propose amendments to the United States Constitution that impose fiscal restraints, all right? Now, let's see, that would be Article 1, some of Article 1. Um, the third is limit terms of office for its officials uh, for the members of Congress, all right? So that's Article 1 again, I guess. Uh, and the second one is limit the power and jurisdiction of the federal government. Can anybody tell me what the purpose is of the Constitution, what it does? It limits the power and authority of the federal government. Now, somebody can say, well, but the Convention of States doesn't say that, right? They don't say that. That's, a, that's these nutty people in South Carolina. That's where Linda Graham comes from, Senator Graham, right? Well, let me read out of here the application. This is the Convention of States handbook for legislators and citizens. And it's application for Convention of the States. And their motto request says, impose physical restraints on federal governments. It's even phrased the same way. Limit the power and jurisdiction of the federal government. Right? So let's let's look at that here for a second. Roger, can you help me just a second? I just want to look at that, what that means. Now, the authority for Congress in setting up Congress and the legislature is in Article 1, okay, of the Constitution. We only have seven articles, right? God gave us one for each day. So, Article 1, we're going to amend that. Uh, the second one is the authority and jurisdiction of the President. So, we got to amend that, right? We're going to look at that, all right? So then we have Article 3. It's to establish the judiciary and the authority of the judiciary. Well, that has got to be amended, right? So that's part of it. So there we go. Now we have Article 5, and they're going to change that because they're going to try to give more power to the states, change the balance of the republic. They're going to change that as well. Uh, Article 6. Uh, it relates to uh, debts contracted uh, before the, the, the Constitution. That doesn't apply, right? So that doesn't apply. And Article 7 is the original ratification for this Constitution because they didn't use the ratification requirements under the Articles of Confederation. They, they get to stay, all right? Now, no one's proposing this, but my gosh, we're going to do that. Let's just go ahead and get to the Declaration of Independence and do something else. So that's what they're saying. It's going to be limited. It's going to be limited to a subject. The subject is the authority of the federal government. That's all the Constitution is about, right? The Constitution doesn't give us any rights whatsoever. The, the Bill of Rights did nothing for us. It restricted the federal government. And what they're going to do is change the, the jurisdiction and authority of the federal government. And that opens up the entire Constitution for them. This is a this is a, a, a resolution for a, a Article Five it was filed in South Carolina, and it says this is this is what they want to do at the convention. They want to impose fiscal restraints on the federal government, and they want to limit the power and jurisdiction of the federal government. 
and I want to limit the terms of office for its official uh, officials and members of Congress. Does it? Can anybody tell me what the Constitution does? What's the purpose of the Constitution? To set the limits of the jurisdiction and authority of the federal government. That's what it's for. That's what the Constitution's for, aren't right? Now, some of you are going to say, oh, but that's those nutty South Carolina people, that, you know, Senator Graham and those kind of nutcakes. So, you know, you can't blame the Conference of States. But let's go to their manual and see what they say about this. They have a, a model application. You know, and Alec has their own model application on that. So let's see what they say about it. What their model application says, the purpose is to impose fiscal restraints on the federal government, to limit the power and jurisdiction of the federal government, and limit the terms of office for federal officials and members of Congress. It's verbatim, right? So that this is what they're advocating. So let's, let's look at this. Let's look at what this, what this means. How many articles do we have in the Constitution? Does anybody know? Uh, eight. No. The Lord gave us one for every day of the week. Seven. Uh, Seven. Okay. okay. So the first one we talk about fiscal restraint. So really they're talking about this. Uh, the last one they're talking about term limits for the office and for officials for the uh, members of Congress. So again they're talking about this. All right, well, let's look at this. Limit the power and jurisdiction of the federal government. Number one, it sets up it sets up the, the authority and jurisdiction of Congress, right? So that's gotta go. And number two sets up the jurisdiction and authority of the president, right? So that's up for amendment. Number three sets up the judiciary, right? There we go. Now this relates to the 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 federal government, among other things, the federal government uh, protecting our Republican status and, and from invasion. That's got to go. Well, this is amending the Constitution. They're going to change that because they want to have the, give the states a, a, a shortcut to do that. So that's got to go. Oh, all right. All right. And here we go. That's got to go. So this, which is moot because this is a ratification, the original ratification that they used for our Constitution, rather than using articles of confederation, which they were supposed to do. Uh, what does that tell you? Next question. There's a chance to respond. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> um, certainly a few things there. Obviously, I'm not going to pick up my Constitution and start ripping it up because I believe in my Constitution. And certainly, uh, I understand the plan on fears as far as ripping up the Constitution, but it's far from that. I want to preserve that Constitution. I want to make a few loopholes that are being exploited in that Constitution eliminated in the fact that the Congress clause for one is, is one I mentioned earlier. The actual calling of the convention. I would ask anybody in this room, why would the founders of, the, of our Constitution, the brilliant men that they are, put two different ways to amend the Constitution if they're both controlled by Congress? What sense does that make? It doesn't make any sense. They knew that the federal government would become tyrannical and out of control. They knew and they believed in state sovereignty. That would be why there's two methods of amending the Constitution. One controlled by Congress, was it, which is an, an ever-running convention that is always in session. It's a convention. We have delegates that are there at all times. They can propose an amendment at any time, even scary ones. And we have a second way that's proposed by the states in a convention process. It shouldn't be any more scary than the one that's going around right now producing crazy laws 
and certainly one that's ever present, our Congress. We shouldn't be scared of the way the framers and our brilliant founders put provisions in our Constitution. We should embrace them when they're needed. As far as the definition of insanity, we keep doing the same thing over and over. We've never done this. We've never actually done a convention of states. We keep trying to elect people to change Washington, and we keep getting the same results. What we're proposing is to try something new. Do it a different way. And trust in the framers and the founders of this country to make sure that we bring the power back to our uninformed electorate to get them engaged, to actually get them energized, to become informed people. You guys are here tonight because you want to be a part of something. You want to be engaged. We want people just like you to go out and engage more people on this process because there is a lot of misinformation that's out there. And there's a lot of fear mongering. There's a lot of scare tactics. <laughs> That's why I'm here today. I'm, I'm here to answer questions. As far as being limited, Phyllis Schlafly certainly came out with an article not too long ago regarding this, in which he, she talks about Warren Burger and, and um, the lights. But the funny thing is, in that, art, that case that she was arguing, my founder was actually right there by her side in that same case. Uh, it's just <clears throat> the the process. Yeah, I heard I heard a lot of a lot of scare, a lot of fear that's coming from the other side here, and I I, I felt that way initially myself when I first heard this process. What about a runaway convention? What about crazy amendments? But what else have we got? What other ideas that are out there? What else is going to change Washington? I'm, I'm, I'm willing to put, I'm ready to stand up and make a difference. And I'm looking, and I want other people to feel that same way too. Um, I know that, again, we've tried and tried and tried to change Washington from the inside out, and it just hasn't happened. But I'm here today to try to get my point across that we can do something here at the local level. Well, my comment would be if you love the Constitution, you better defend it and not sit around trying to amend it. The purpose of the amendment uh, clause in the Constitution is to correct the errors, if there, if, if we discover the errors. Uh, what the Convention of States people are talking about is not correcting errors. They're saying we're going to use Article 5 as a surrogate to replace our responsibility to do our job in this government. The founders set up a participatory government, right? We have the central government in D.C., we have the states, and the third leg of that was we the people. And if you look at the Federalist Papers, they tell you that. They say, Hamilton says in 28, he says, if the federal government gets overbearing, then the states will put it in its place, even if they have to go to war, right? He says, if the states get overbearing, the feds will put them in check. And, this, and the key to it was that the citizens would support one or the other. We're the mortar between the bricks, and the mortar's gone, and the wall's wobbling. I suggest that we do our job Again, uh, is there any amendment that would make these clowns all of a sudden respect their oath and respect your rights? Does that make any logical sense to anybody? Uh, and I'll tell you, the founders would tell you, you had better be afraid. The most dangerous thing in this world throughout history has been a government gone awry. We had better fear it. The founders feared the government. That's why they didn't give us the Constitution. That's why they gave the militia to the states. 
because they feared the government. So, yeah, I fear it. Uh, but it's more righteous indignation. We're not asking for this. We have foundations and NGOs and everybody else that's running around trying to get this done. We're not doing it. I never asked for it. Since we started talking about the last question, the last question is, would amending the Constitution make Congress obey the Constitution any more than it does now? David, you want to start that? I certainly can. I think amending the Constitution um, is a game changer in the fact that it changes those rules that the, that Congress, the Supreme Court, um, have to play by. The Constitution is the founding of our laws. If in fact we feel that they're not, or they're usurping the power that was granted to them, what are other, what are other choices? Do we? pass new laws? Do we uh, rely on the Supreme Court and five justices every June to make it a right decision? Does we anxiously wait for that decision to be handed down? No. The, the Supreme Court has made plenty of bad decisions and certainly was never set up to be in the power that it is right now. There, what we propose is the what the, the framers knew would happen at some point. And to your point, I, I love this Constitution and I do support it. I want it to be returned to the initial concept. Limited government, limited powers by the federal government, and everything else enumerated to the states. The framers knew that this day would come and it's precisely why George Mason said it at the convention. We've got to have a second way to amend the Constitution because if, in fact, the legislature is corrupt, they will never fix themselves. Well, and again, I have to say, uh, you know, what they're suggesting is like this. We have a stop sign that every, all the drivers just fell by, they don't stop, right? So the proposal is, we're now going to put up a new stop sign. And somehow the drivers are all of a sudden going to stop. Now, they're not telling us how that works, but they're telling us that they want to talk about the size of the sign, the color of the sign, and where it goes, and you know, what post you're going to use, and how deep. We're going to talk about all that. But they're not going to tell us how putting up a new stop sign is going to make the drivers stop, or make Congress stop. See, that's what the Constitution is. It's a stop sign. It says Congress, federal government, you can't go beyond this point. All right? The problem with the stop, it isn't with the stop sign. The problem is, where's the traffic cop to enforce it? We are the traffic cop, right? We're the traffic cop. We don't need to change it. We need to do our job. That's the problem. The other thing is they want to say, that we've got to do something. And I've heard Chris Kobach say this. Chris Kobach has promoted this in Kansas. And we had a debate on that, and I kept backing him up. You know, well, they can, we, the states can control it. Well, maybe they can't, blah, blah, blah. So finally he says, well, don't worry about it. That's why he told a bunch of us. Don't worry about it, because they'll never call it. We're just going to bluff them and you know, shoot a, a shot across the bow and get them to, to straighten up. Really? Does anybody really think that's going to work? It's it just nuts. And what that's like is, you know, doing something for the sake of doing something is like drilling holes in the hull of the Titanic to let the water out. You may not make your situation any better. Now, I'll tell you, my opinion is we'll never get the federal government in control. We people. The founders knew that. We have to work with the states. We have to get the states under control. 
before we can ever get the federal government under control. And you know how we do that? And I'm going to lead you on this. I'll work with you guys on this. If you want to make a real change, let's get a constitutional amendment in this state and give a citizen referendum initiative and a recall that applies to every politician in this state from dog catcher to the governor. That's what Colorado did, and they kicked the bombs out. Yeah, let's do something useful. Let's not waste any more time. I'm not proposing that we work through the system. It's our system. Let's take control of it and get it, get it working again. This is a waste of time. At the very best, it accomplishes nothing, right? Think about this. I'm going to say that all of his uh, technical uh, aspects of how the convention works are correct. He's going to get every amendment he wants, right? Every amendment he wants in the language he wants. And I'll go further and say the chairman of the convention is going to be the Archangel Michael. And over half of the delegates will be angels. All right, and when they deliver that and it's ratified in record time and it's delivered to the federal government Congress and it has this holy glow about it, do you think they're gonna pay attention? They've been violating their sacred oath for a hundred years. Right here in this state, we, we had Lynn Jenkins write a letter to the conference committee on the 2012 NADA the citizen detention provisions and said those are unconstitutional and they've got to come out. She acknowledged before the final bill it was unconstitutional in writing. I got the letter. Right? And what did the conference committee do? They did what the neocons and the president wanted. They passed the bill with the citizen detention provisions in there and they got over half of your bill of rights. So what did she do? She voted for it. She already acknowledged it was unconstitutional and she voted for it. Well, a few weeks later, I happened to catch her in Topeka, Kansas at a 912 meeting. I was having, I had had a sovereignty rally that year like I was. I've done that for five years. And so some of us went over to this meeting and we were at her. And at first she tried to deny it. A representative, a federal representative was trying to deny the facts. I couldn't believe it. So we finally pinned her down, and why didn't she say, yes, I know, there was a problem, but I thought the Supreme Court would straighten it out. Right? Her oath says she will support the Constitution. That means she cannot propose, she cannot support, she cannot vote for, she cannot enforce, and she can't help anybody else do any of those things. That's not constitutional. And under her oath of office to protect the Constitution, she has an obligation to have a working knowledge of the Constitution. Right? You can't protect something you don't understand. Right? And she just blew it off. And you know what? Every one of our congressmen, except Mr. Hulescamp, voted for that. And then they wanted the story about what it did. So we're going to pick them a brand new shiny Constitution, and they're going to be rebaptized or something, I guess. No one's explained it, and then they're going to follow their oath. They're going to glory to God. I'm going to, I'm going to stay on the straight and narrow and follow my oath. Really? I think not. And Mr. Fry and myself, we don't differ on our opinions on, on conservative issues. I think there's about 99% of what we're going to say or think and agree. Um, we're very conservative individuals. I think there's one item, again, that we're here today to, to speak about, and that's the Convention of States Project and or Article 5 in the in general. And I'll take one, one piece of what he had to say out of his, his last statement. And he may mention it's not worth our time. And I, I firmly believe that it is worth our time. <coughs> Just like every other thing and every other fight that we have in front of us. All those fights that he mentioned are all worthy of our time, including this one. This is a worthwhile cause. And I, that's why I support it. It is a solution big enough 
to tackle a lot of the problems at the federal level. Again, it doesn't tackle much at the state level except for getting people to understand and, and recognize who their state representatives and state senators are because all of a sudden in this process the states have a lot more power and those states reps and state all of a sudden mean more to those individuals. They're not just another person um, that goes to Topeka. They're a person that actually can wield some power in Washington. And that's what we're proposing. I did study the Constitution when I was in high school in 1959. <laughs> Thank you. What is the key? President, who has been ignoring our present constitution, yes, uh, from ignoring this one. That's a very good question no. because you know Senator Roberts addressed what, he, what the president talked about today. I mean, we've got a lot of those presidents out there right now threatening to use his pen and the telephone to subvert Congress. So, what's going to stop him from you know, ignoring. Yeah, ignoring new new amendments? Yeah. Um, it, it's it's a problem that we're going to face no matter if we go down our road or not. Uh, we we need to deal with that. We definitely do. It's the rule of law, and he's subject to the rule of law just like anybody else. We need to hold him accountable. Uh, Convention of the state isn't going to hold him accountable. That's the people need to definitely do that. Um, Okay, I'm going to open this up to questions uh, from the audience. Uh, then I'm going to have some final comments and close it up. Then I will announce uh, what our program is for next month. And who has any questions? I will... Steve? <coughs> Mine is kind of a comment I would like to answer, I guess, for Mr. Snyder on this exact issue that he was talking about. Um, you know, we got a tyrannical president, tyrannical administration, we got a Congress with no backbone that will hold him accountable to follow the Constitution. So, like he said, how is changing the Constitution going to all of a sudden make them start obeying the Constitution? Uh, there's just we would be better served instead of wasting our time, which is what it is, trying to do this, this uh, convention in finding ways to inf make them or hold them accountable and enforce the Constitution the way it's written, written now. Because you're still going to have to do that. You write a new Constitution, they're not going to obey it, they're not going to honor it. You're still going to have to find a way to enforce it and, and hold them accountable to it. So our time would be better served just to start with to make them abide by the Constitution and follow the Constitution. Tell me how you're going to make them all of a sudden, like you said, see the light and start following the Constitution when they're traveling over it right now. Okay, sure. Um, as far as your question is concerned, <clears throat> how do they follow the Constitution? Uh, well, that's a great question, actually. What's... What, I heard some of what he proposed as far as how we're going to get him to start following the Constitution, but what is your what is the plan in our alternative? What is what is the plan that's out there to get them to start start following the Constitution that we have in place? Our plan is simple in the fact that we want to put certain rules in the Constitution that are in black and white for all people to see that this is the meaning, this is what you must follow. If they want to break a black and white statement that's written in the Constitution, because right now they're using subtle nuances as, as a reason for their actions. What we want to do is sure up some of the things that are in there so it is in black and white. And if, in fact, they continue to do it, we're, we're not advocating to do all the things that 
we're doing it that we want to do at the local level, at the state level, and everything else. We're advocating this as a tool in conjunction with everything else. It's black and white now, so I don't know what. Okay. In my opinion, it is, yeah. but not in Washington. Yeah, they'll, they'll have the same argument that it's not. Yeah. Again. And that's yeah. what that's what we would be looking to sure up is to try to get some black and white. It won't make a difference. Well, I, I don't have that defeatist yeah. attitude myself. I understand your point. I understand Mr. Fry's point, but I'm willing to do something at the federal level as well, and that's my solution. government has gotten out of control. But I think instead of first pointing the finger at the government, I think we need to look at ourselves. We have become complacent and we have become greedy. Some think about how many good people we have elected to Congress, but we will vote for them again if they bring something back to us, a bridge to nowhere. So. How many of us really understand the Constitution? I, for one, don't. I appreciate the fact that the Tea Party has had meetings to help us understand it better. But I guess I'm not in favor of just creating additional laws when we have laws already that should take care of them. For example, if we've already got a law that says a felon cannot carry a gun, then why do we have to start a new law that says they can't carry this type of gun with this type of magazine? And, it, you know, we've got a law that will should take the guns out of the hands of the criminals, but we're not enforcing it, partly because of political preference. So, I'm really not in favor of doing what you're proposing if we don't at first become very educated because we could have 10 people representing Kansas going there with 15 different ideas. How do we get together on what we really want to limit government? I, you know, our Constitution was created a long time ago and things have changed so if we're going to limit government do we not want them to help the poor states where the richer states have the money do you, you know I, i'm for it but how do you go about that process and we need a lot of education uh, a lot of wisdom being put into what we're asking part of what we're doing we're you know, we've got stalemates in Congress, so we're asking the Supreme Court to settle things that we should be settling here. You know, uh, our, our ability to elect or refuse to re-elect somebody is our strongest, one of our strongest uh, means of controlling Congress. You know, we, we've come up with another idea, a, a fifth article. Well, here's another one. We can take up our arms as a Second Amendment, and I'm not advocating that, but our Second Amendment allows us to do that if our government gets totally out of control. Here's another thing we could do. Shut off all of our funds to the government. Yeah, they can say that's unconstitutional. How many of us can they put in prison? You shut off the funds, and I'll guarantee you, you'll see changes overnight. So we've got to be very careful, I think, about how we're going to go about getting control again, getting it back to the people, but we first got to become educated as to what we want, know what we want, and then hold them to the fire on that. I agree, pull them out of office, state or federal. Uh, you know, if they're not doing what we sent them there for, I praise Tim Cruz for what he's doing from Texas. That's what he told his constituents he would go and do. That's the type of people we need. Amen.
but he knew what they wanted of him. They, he, he proposed these things and that's how he was voted. A lot of people say the same thing he did, but go there and do nothing. And part of it is our fault because we expect them to do something for us individually rather than for the good of the country. By the way, uh, one of Senate, Senator Ted Cruz's uh, not so friendly senators, not so friendly senators, Senator John McCain, I read that uh, the state of Arizona has censored him. I don't know if you've seen that. I guess by listening to this tonight, um, I've got kind of a question, but I guess to, to back it up, you're both right. Both of you are right. My fear right now is that during the Bush administration, Congress was proposing some laws. They are proposing them. And the Democrats started putting blocks in the way and they started to filibuster things and then they talked about something and I'll admit I'm far from knowing the Constitution inside and out. I've read it several times. I try to study it but there's a lot I don't understand. But they brought up this thing called the nuclear option. If we could pass this and all of a sudden all hell broke loose on the network TV. We can't do this. We can't do this. We can't do it. Guess what? We did it with the Democratic Senate. It wasn't mentioned anywhere in the news. They just kind of hushed it up. But first, they let us put our foot in our mouth, so to speak, on something that they knew that they could badger us into not doing, and then turn around and do, try it right on us and say, how can it be bad? You guys wanted to do it in the first place. So my question, I guess, would be, um, here is a Hispanic talking about say, reform for, for illegals, all right? What I see happening right now is they're opening the border up, letting more and more and more in until they've got themselves a voting ban that will take care of all this for us. I see one, at most, maybe two more amnesty passes, and they've got a majority rule of whichever these people think are in their best interest. We've got entitlements on the rent raise going up nuts. I'll give you this if you vote for me. I'll give you ten bucks if you vote for me. That's all. That's about it anymore. They're just asking for, for favors to do it back. So my question is, if we don't act now to do something, what do we need to do? Because we are trying to put different people into office these people either get stomped out and snuffed out in the political process coming through there, or they come in and they get turned right away. I grew up in Utah. I remember as a little kid, a young kid, an up-and-coming person running for senator. His name was Orrin Hatch. His main thing was, this guy's been in for 32 years. Why do we want to keep sending him to office? He's in for 36 now. So what would we do to change it in both ways? I'm afraid to change the, the Constitution. I really am. But what can we do in lieu of it, the way things are going right now, in an absolutely corrupt system that, that you've got no way of, of doing? Because I guarantee you, this will happen, and this will happen in the next two decades. They will be changing the Constitution. Over my dead and buried body. <laughs> okay, we have a we have a question back here. Uh, I want to thank both of you gentlemen for your time and your effort. But I I just wonder where we are today in this country. Does anybody see any correlation between the decline and fall of the Roman Empire? Oh yeah. Of course. By the way, uh, this young man is Vernon Stearman, who was a, uh, how many uh, uh, 
uh, what's the term, um, Chester County attorney for? I ain't a federal attorney. <laughs> uh, so he has many, many years of experience with the law, and he's writing the book. So we're looking forward to the book. We have a question back here. Hi, my name is Dave Porter. I'm from Lloyd, Kansas. Uh, I agree with both your positions. I came in here saying, uh, not my constitutional convention, but you never gave any alternatives if we don't have them. I did give an alternative. I did. But the problem with people is they're apathetic. You're not going to get them to do anything. It's our job. It's our it's job. It might be our job to see young people. Look at the people that are in here. If we don't do it, we might as well give it up. It's our job. It's our moral duty no. and our patriotic duty. If they're apathetic, they deserve what they get, right? Well, we were getting what we were supposed to get right now. You better believe we are, now, but we better get to it. He offered an alternative, Constitutional Convention. I agree with you. I think it would be a waste of time. I don't think it's going to accomplish anything. But I believe we have to explore all avenues. If we don't, what are the alternatives? I mean, we're looking at a possible revolution. Well, it's going to be blood. One thing is, we've been exploring this avenue since the 1960s when the Ford Foundation started this movement. We've been reviewing it for 50 years. It's the same thing. About every 10 years, they pop up again. Once, once again, you get an NGO, a corporation that's trying to dictate what the government's going to be. I don't buy for anybody except the people to do this. The problem is, we have an uninformed public out there that doesn't know what's going on. All they know is something's wrong. But they don't know what to do. And before we get them motivated, we need to be looking at educating them. But the problem is, you can't get them to turn the TV on. Once you get the TV off, start reading, start getting yourself educated, maybe. But I really don't see much hope either way. I mean, we might have a constitutional convention, and it'd be fantastic. I like to go right back to the uh, Articles of Confederation. I think that'd be the best thing to do, put the government back in its place. So right now, I, 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 I really don't see much, but I want to explore every avenue before we get to that ultimate step. And right now, I want to say, you've got a room full of people that are 40 plus, okay? I don't see many young people here. The problem is you've got to get the people, the young people, motivated to do this, and right now, I just don't see it happening. Well, one thing I'll say is that it's, each of our responsibility, individually, patriotic and moral responsibility before God to take this fight on. This country has been blessed with the most liberty of any country in the history of mankind. And up until recently, we were the most prosperous. It was a gift from God, right? And we are not paying honor to God and His gifts. We're letting them be ripped off from us, all right? So, don't sit on your butt because somebody else won't do anything. You don't have to pay for what they don't do or do do. You are held to account for what you do. You stand up. You make the noise. I've been doing this for seven years. I don't get paid. When, when the brown back was trying to promote Obamacare in this state, I drove 3,000 miles around this state to inform people and to rally against it. Okay? I, I didn't ask, is anybody behind me Last weekend, I was at a, a Boy Scout merit badge, and I sat in on my sons, and it was Citizenship of the Nation. And his instructor made the comment to them, we live in a democracy. Wham! My son's hands up. We don't live in a democracy. Well, yeah, we do. We live in a republic. We don't live in a, well, okay, you're right. We do live in a kind of a different right. And then he said, and I'm not blaming him because you know, he's ignorant, although, you know, whose fault is it? It's our fault. It's all our fault. I was ignorant until about seven years ago. So then he says, the instructor says, the government's number one priority is to protect us. Wham! And my son says, that's not true. Their job is to protect our rights. The only way you protect somebody is you confine them and take away their liberty. You take them and bury them somewhere. 
That's how you protect people. That's not the government's job. Their job is to protect our rights. And what are they doing? They're protecting us, right? What's the NSA doing by spying all of, all of us unconstitutionally? They're protecting us. Don't protect me. All protect me. Take care of my rights. Close the border. Keep all those terrorists and everybody from coming in. And all take care of me, right? But you got to do it. I talk to my kids. I talk to my friends. And, but again, if they don't want to do something, it's still your job to go out there and do something. You know, it just is. I'm sorry. And you'll be held to account if you don't. And let me just add something to that. And to your point, uh, I firmly agree. It is our responsibility to educate our kids and our, our, our friends and anybody that we can talk to. 100% is, it is also human nature that there is going to be apathy. Uh, the Frankers knew this, um, and also an uninformed electorate. There is, that is the, one of the main reasons we are a republic. The Frankers did not want a popular vote on a lot of elections, because quite frankly, there's a lot of people out there that I'll probably be recorded on saying this, that shouldn't be voting that way. Okay, um, just because they can vote, and they do, it's just sad sometimes to think about that um, their vote is canceling out an informed individuals. Can't yeah, agree. Okay. <laughs> exactly, but that's that's the beauty of the framers' idea of a republic, and the republic is is certainly the way to go. Um, and it's it was originally designed to have checks and balances, and we're so far out in one amendment really took its toll on, on the, the check on the federal government. That was one you mentioned earlier, the 16th Amendment, which eliminated the, the state legislators from uh, selecting their own senator, for each state senators. And I will say that one amendment was brought upon with the threat of having a convention of states. Something I hate as far as an amendment, but was the reason for it is because the Convention of the States was being proposed at that point. And the, it spurred the Congress to go ahead and submit the, um, the, um, the, the amendment to the states for ratification. In other words, states actually ratified, giving away their own power. It's amazing to me to think about it at this point. But it's because the grassroots were there and they had the, the movement. And that's what we're trying to get on the conservative side. It's truly that movement, that, that urge from groups such as this to bring back the original intent of that, the, the Constitution. So. May I interject? It's the it's 17th Amendment that affected the Senate, not, not the 16th. The 16th was the income taxes. Thank you. I think you need to know your constitution, That's sir. Right. You remind me of my son. <laughs> <laughs> Numbers and names. Yeah. That's right. And I, I'd like to address that, actually. Yeah. Some people call it semantics. You say black and white, by the way. <laughs> Some people call it semantics. Um, I think Rush Limbaugh said Mr. Clinton words mean things. And I've said, since I got involved in this thing in 2008, that our problem um, kind of stems from the fact that we've allowed liberals in the Democrat Party and the Republican Party to redefine terms. We don't call it extortion anymore, we call it income tax. We don't call it murder anymore, we call it abortion now. And it's not a baby, it's a fetus. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I want both of you guys, and I, I, now here's the deal, what, whoever takes off this answer first, and I want to answer this, but whoever takes the answer first, the other guy wants you to listen, if you're going to repeat what he said, then we'll waste some time, let's get on to the next question, okay? Because I, I, I hope that there's a good answer to this. I've heard this deal about Article 5 Comic Con, a dear friend of mine, Topeka Paul Dagner, introduced me to this idea through the Paul Burson Society, and I've watched their videos and stuff. And I totally agree at that time it was a bad idea. Actually, coming out here riding with Richard, or Richard riding with me, I was on the fence again. Um, and, and, and so don't take me as being real biased in this question. Originally, I heard the Article 5 convention and, 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 and learned all, I thought I learned all about that. I don't know everything. I'm high school educated, made three and a half years through high school. 
But then we hear this thing, Chris Kobach and, and, and Mark Levin talks on the radio about a convention of states, and they act like it's two different things. Could you, could you guys clarify that for me? Because I'm, I was thinking it was two different things so tonight. We've kind of mixed them all together. It's the same thing. And I, I, I'd just like some just discussion on that or argument or something. Well, see, part of the, the marketing philosophy of this movement is, you know, they, they keep changing, right? So initially, <coughs> the open convention they wanted, people said, no, we don't want that. Then they set a limited uh, uh, convention said no we don't want that and then they said well we're going to do a convention of states and people said well we don't want that uh, and so that's where we are today uh, a convention of states uh, is a convention of states it's a convention that's called by a state where states get together uh, and they convene and discuss whatever they're going to uh, discuss they want to call the convention of states article 5 a convention of states it is a convention and delegates from the states will probably be there, but it's not a convention of states. It's a marketing ploy to make you think that the states are in complete control of what's going on. And if you look at Article 5, it's very simple to understand that the states, their, their duty, their part of it is to make an application. Once they make an application, unless Congress chooses for them to uh, ratify it in the legislature, there's there's not a lot that they're doing. Uh, and I mean, they want to say there's been all these convention of states. Well, there have been convention of states, but there has never been an Article 5 convention. And it's not uh, a convention of states. And we've had the Supreme Court uh, talk about that. Uh, in a case, it was not a, a Article 5 convention. It was a congressional amendment. And one of the states, Congress said, you have to, you have to do it to the legislature. You have to ratify it to the legislature. And the state said, we're not going to do that. We're going to give it to the people, right? We're not going to do that. And the Supreme Court said, you can't do that. This is a national, a, a national power granted to Congress. They get to say, you don't have the authority. It's national. You do not have the authority to make up your own rules. When Congress says you have to do uh, through the legislature, it has to be through the legislature. And I suspect that's what they tell us on a on a convention that, uh, that the states are, are called into. Uh, to answer your question, uh, you mentioned ConCon or, conven or a constitutional convention. There is a difference between a constitutional convention and an Article 5 convention, also known as a convention of states. Constitutional convention, we had one of those. That was a the beginning of the Constitution. They wrote the Constitution that we operate under now. In Article 5, it specifically says a convention for the sole purpose of proposing amendments. It's not for writing a new Constitution, it's for amending or providing for errors in the Constitution, as he graciously added earlier. But it's for the sole purpose of amending or proposing actually amendments to the states for ratification. It's a se separate process from the first, the first method that is mentioned in Article Five, which Congress uh, would propose the amendments. Yeah, I just want to clarify that uh, real quickly. Um, technically, a convention of states, or I'm sorry, a, a constitutional convention is a convention that's to write a constitution. Okay, that that's what it would be technically. Uh, and so you are supposed to take comfort from that because we're not going to do that. We're going to have an amendments constitution or amendments convention. But let me tell you something. An amendment is the change of one period or it's the change of everything but one period. Right? How, how do you delineate what the change is? All right? They're, they're a distinction without a difference or can be. And if you're going to have a convention based on what that uh, South Carolina resolution is asking for, you know, I, I'd have to throw another constitution for that. I mean, it, everything's open, right? Okay, we're going to have one more question, Steve. Yeah, I just wanted to kind of ask a question for clarification. The, uh, the Constitution is the supreme law of the land. 
it affects all the states, all the counties, the federal government, that any laws passed have, cannot violate the Constitution of the United States. And we just answer quickly, true, false, yes, no, each one of you. I'm sorry, I, I guess I didn't. It's the supreme law of the land. Any law passed in any state, any county, cannot violate the Constitution of the United States. That's my understanding, yes. Your understanding. It's absolutely, that's absolutely false. The Constitution says that the supreme law of the land is the Constitution and any federal law that's passed pursuant to the Constitution. If a federal law is not passed pursuant to the Constitution, it is null and void. It is no law at all. You see, the Constitution really is a stop sign. It's a barrier. And if they well, pass that, you just repeated what I just said. If it does not pass the Constitution, it is not valid. It is not a law. Whether it's a federal law oh, or a state law. I didn't hear that. Yeah, because you're absolutely correct. It's not some people think some people think, well, it just affects the federal government. Yeah, that's not true. No. Thank you. That's how it's made. Yes. Okay. So and, and, and let me let me clarify this though, so you understand this. If it's if, if it's unconstitutional, it's automatically nullified under Article Six of the Constitution. There is no such thing as state nullification that a lot of people want to say. And one of the reasons states can't nullify is because it's automatically nullified. And every state officer has taken an oath to protect the Constitution and not enforce, support, uh, or sponsor an unconstitutional act, nor any of the federal government. Right? Remember Lynn Jenkins? She violated her oath when she did something she knew to be unconstitutional. So you just said the illegal law is not a law at all. Not a law. Okay, so as for the states, you brought up the sovereign state again. These are sovereign states, like sovereign nations, that created this centralized government. So consequently, uh, the uh, and so each state is basically a sovereign country within itself. Yeah, that's true. That, that's true. And, and, but here's something else you have to understand that, that very, very few people understand and very few politicians understand it. There is the inherent sovereign principle of allegiance and protection that applies to the states. And what that says is, in exchange for your allegiance, all right, your loyalty, they are going to protect you. And that means if anybody attempts to infringe upon your rights, they have to intervene or interpose. The federal government? To the state, the state governments. And Thank that you. includes against the federal government, and they're not doing it. And in fact, when they take when they take money for education, it's unconstitutional, and it's unconstitutional not only for the feds, it's unconstitutional for the state to accept money that the feds have no authority to give. Right. Same way the state government should be defending the citizens of this state. Absolutely. The, the fundamental problem that we have is, uh, under the constitutional framework, is that the states aren't doing their job. And they're not doing their job because we're not doing our job. Oh, right, because we're the ultimate managers and, and ultimately responsible. Absolutely. Absolutely. One, one last thing is the fact that for this uh, Fifth Amendment Convention, to me, this is just another deal to, for that we're going to use up the next 20 years, which I will be here, uh, trying to get people that we just need a bigger mob, you know, where, where in fact the individual is the mob within themselves. And my, my solution to it is we don't need a new constitution or amendment to the constitution. We need to enforce the constitution we have right now. Amen, brother. You know, the other thing that they don't address is the fact that, you know, that they don't act like the socialists and the progressives and the abortionists and the anti gun people are going to show up to this dance. Do you, does anybody here think that they're not going to show up to this dance? They're going to be there. They're kind of play the music. Why don't you just cut to the chase? The whole bottom is, is, is as you alluded to several of you, is your open office. Yeah. That's the whole problem. They're not they're not following so their own office. We are. How? Stop rubber stamping and coming Okay. Now you know, what, what I suggest is what I suggest is we pass, we we as citizens gang up on those guys 
and we force them to pass an initiative and a referendum so we can back down laws that they are that when they're trying to do you know, goofy stuff and we can we can have our own laws when they won't don't have the courage to do that and we have a recall just like they did in colorado we pull them out of office. When Governor Brownback is telling us that, that Obamacare is unconstitutional, he's going to protect us from it, and then he goes and signs an agreement with the federal government that says he's going to implement Obamacare, and we have Obamacare in Kansas now, thanks to the governor, we should be calling his back. But see, that's the other problem. Some people say, oh, it's lesser of two evils. You can't have a Democrat in there. You've got to, if you go for the lesser of two evils, if you support the lesser of two evils, it's evil, and you're going to end up with evil. What do we have now? We've got evil up to our ears. Well, let's make a point, then. How you get people to uh, accept their oath of office as their oath of office, and they will do it? The only way to do it is to kick their butts out, well, yes. because none of them do it. Right, so, so none of them do that. That's it. the hardest thing to do, is because you put 10 people in a room to vote, you don't know how they're going to vote. It's just like my dad said one time, Whenever somebody goes into that boat group and pulls the curtain, you don't know what they're going to do. Well, that's true. How many times you go to vote sometimes? <laughs> okay, let me, uh, let me finalize uh, everything. First of all, I thank you for coming. I appreciate it. How about a big hand for these two gentlemen? David Snyder and Richard Fry. I mean, this is, this is what it's all about. We're talking about an Article 5 convention. Let me just say this. God gave Moses the Ten Commandments, and people don't follow them. And if God would give America a new, perfect constitution, there's no guarantee that anybody would follow it. Uh, Richard has a uh, resource uh, sheet back here on the Article 5 debate. You'll have some back there if anybody is interested.